That is, right up until some gourmand says, Ugh, today I crave bird spit. <laughs> it's time for some more salmonella again. Specifically, this one on banned food. I know there are times when eating and drinking is prohibited in the event of a radiation release. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this one out. <laughs> Hey, Majors. So majors? Used to him saying, hey, kids, I guess we got promoted? <laughs> cool. I'd like to start off with a little biology lesson. When a species finds itself living on an island, it can start to evolve in strange ways based on the different pressures applied by the new environment. This is called island syndrome, and while it can manifest in a lot of ways, the biggest driving force is often a lack of predators. For example, the dodo lost its ability to fly since there was nothing to flee from. The saint killed a field mouse got twice as big since it no longer had to hide. And with no one around to bully them, the Sardinians started putting maggots in their cheese. It is crazy how animals can kind of change their behavior. We actually saw something like that happen after the Chernobyl accident. What wasn't the case of an island, but it kind of had a similar effect with the Chernobyl exclusion zone. There is the absence of humans, or at least a large population of the humans, has enabled the ecosystems to actually thrive. No humans disturbing, no hunting. It's a bit of a wildlife sanctuary. Plus, with the radiation, the frogs changed color. Well, kind of. You see more of the black ones. And that's just higher levels of melanin. The ones in that blackish color are closer to the Chernobyl plant as a protective response to the radiation. Note that they didn't actually change color. It's more of just a population shift. You're seeing more of those in close proximity to the bud. It's kind of a similar sort of adaptation. Meet Kazumartsu, literal translation, rotten cheese. <laughs> it's made by taking rotten a perfectly cheese. good wheel of pecorino and letting a special type of fly lay eggs in it. The fly babies then work to partially uh. digest the cheese, rendering it goopy, and wet and maybe quite tasty and worm filled. Now cheese as a concept is already quite suspect. It's clotted milk that you fill with bacteria and mold and let sit for a while. But cheese is safe and delicious. <laughs> cheese is my friend. I trust cheese. So my guard would be down around Kazumatsu. <laughs> I've learned to look past you. cheese's childhood. Strange upbringings are what give them- <laughs> Big nose. <laughs> oh no their character. But it turns out, those maggots are still alive, and if you don't chew well enough, they can cause enteric myiasis, which is a fancy term for fly larvae living in your intestines. Symptoms are similar uh. to food poisoning, except with the added psychic pain of knowing that, again, your bowels are full of squiggly new friends. It's for this reason- That's nasty. Reason that Kazumartsu is banned in the EU and elsewhere. A black market still exists, Ugh. which is wild, and it's not a small one. In 2019, the illicit Kazumartsu trade was estimated to be worth 2 to 3 million euros annually. Personally, wow. I would just do it prohibition style, like definitely don't put these fly eggs on this sumptuous wheel of pecorino. But if you do, you absolutely <laughs> shouldn't keep it warm and damp for a week. But although it's traditional to leave the larvae alive when you eat your mag and cheese, some consumers still prefer them dead, shockingly. It's fascinating how many nasty parts are in the preparation of certain foods. It really kind of kind of puts things into perspective. I can't say I've ever had this type of cheese, but can understand why it's banned. Anything that makes you that sick just gets that contaminated. I know after after a radiological release, when you get to a certain threshold, there in the emergency planning, there will be a ban on eating and drinking within the vicinity of the power plant. We've actually run several drills on that where you couldn't actually eat anything during the drill. So it's it's gotten to where people would, you'd actually get a good sized meal before the drill actually starts. Not that you're in any real danger. There's no real radiological release or anything. Since it's just a simulation, but people like to bring in a bunch of donuts and kolaches and <laughs> stuff to be sure you have plenty of food for the rest of the day. But the reason why you would ban it in the event of a radiological release is internal dose is so much worse compared to external dose. And that's for two reasons. One is some of the more hazardous fission products could just get inside you if you eat them, such as cesium-137, a metal with a half-life of about 30 years can get inside of your bloodstream. Now, eating any metal is not exactly the best thing for your kidneys, but it's also going to give you internal dose while it's being metabolized by your body. And the second thing is internal dose. It's a lot harder to control. 
And the second reason is it's just worse in terms of the magnitude of the dose. It's going to be affecting your internal organs. We take for granted that our skin and our clothes actually act as a shield from a lot of forms of radiation, such as al alpha particles and beta particles. It doesn't do much against gamma radiation, but it'll shield against a lot of alpha and betas. However, if it's inside your body, that's not going to help you. So that is why eating and drinking is banned during a radiological relief. In that case, one puts the cheese in a sealed bag, and when the maggots run out of oxygen, they writhe around and fling themselves all over the place. Yeah. This is heard as a distinct pitter-patter against the walls of the bag, and when the sound stops, the contents are ready to eat, like popcorn. Shark fin soup is one most of us have heard about already, mostly in reference to its effect on shark populations yes. and the wastefulness that goes into making it. Until recently, though, I never looked into the nature of the dish itself. I figured, right, the fins are just the only part of the shark worth eating. Big whoop. It's probably not much different from, like, sword fish. Apparently though, I had it backwards. Shark fins aren't even meat. They're made almost entirely of cartilage and collagen. They yeah. are the last part we should be eating. That's why it's only made into soup, because without being soaked in broth, it has zero flavor or nutritional value on Kind of like how people put bones in soup, sure. Never had it. I've also heard of shark fin pie, but that's like an ice cream dessert. It's actually pretty good, but has nothing to do with actual shark fin. Their only redeeming quality is their unique <sighs> mouthfeel due to how stringily the collagen grows. <laughs> it looks like his uh, Terrare character, the guy that eats everything. If you want to see my reaction to that, I'll pin that one down in the comments below. That one's quite vile. In structures called ceratotrichia. The texture has been described as somewhere between chewy and crunchy, which I find describes most things, actually. Other adjectives present on Wikipedia include snappy, gelatinous, and sinewy. The exact sensation sinewy. of eating this substance remains a mystery to me, and the unintended side effect of all this research is that I now really want to try it. Like, it's a big trade. I've got to be the one that's wrong. There is imitation shark fin soup available, but I've already decided that it's not nearly as good, so I've come up with a compromise of this controversy. Imitation Everyone on everything. Earth gets just one bite. Say there's 10 bites to a fin, 4 fins to a shark, 200 million sharks die, sure, a necessary casualty, but then we wow. can end the practice forever. All done. You can finally rest, Mr. Ming. Come here, baby. Aww. Aki. What? what? Aki. Where? Aki. The Aki is Aki? a fruit originally- <laughs> That's pretty clever. So back to the shark one, on the note of banned seafood. After Japan released treated wastewater, from Fukushima. So this water was filtered, processed, but before that it was actually stored in tanks at the Fukushima site so some of it could decay away even prior to treatment. It uses a process called the uh, Advanced Liquid Processing System in order to filter, purify, and treat the radioactive wastewater. And it's monitored by radiation monitors and is sampled by chemistry technicians and these are have the highest level of scrutiny for water chemistry sampling before it gets released into the environment. So after all the processing and the sampling they were found to be within release st standards and not the special post-accident one. They didn't make anything else up. The regular radioactive effluent standards that required them to be a certain below a certain level of activity the same ones that are used routine releases around the world. Because after all, at this point, considering how heavily treated and how they let a lot of it decay away, you're basically pumping water into more water at that point. However, China still banned the import of seafood from Japan. All of Japan, not even just the prefectures near Fukushima. Which is ironic because Chinese nuclear power plants and other effluent sources do not meet the same international wastewater standards. I'm not saying that it's at dangerous levels, but it's ironic for them to do so when their own effluent standards aren't up to the same international standards that are accepted in the rest of the world. So Japanese seafood is still safe to eat, at least when it comes to level of radioactivity. I can't speak for individual allergy cases or anything like that. From West Africa, which is most commonly associated with Jamaican cuisine, where it appears in such dishes as ackee and saltfish. These alien Never kidneys here are called the arrows, <laughs> and they're the only part- Alien kidneys. 
<laughs> it does look like that. Well done. Part of the fruit that's actually eaten. The flavor is on the savory side, being described as kind of nutty or bean-like. What makes the ackee controversial, though, is the effects it can cause when prepared oh, improperly. No. If the arrows are allowed to completely ripen, they're harmless. But if you eat them too early, or don't thoroughly clean off all the non-arrow stuff, they can cause Jamaican vomiting sickness. This disease doesn't sound real, it sounds- Some make you sick without waiting long enough. That's a bit like radioactive decay, you gotta wait for the bad stuff to go away. And also cleaning and deconning, so there's some overlap there. Wow. It's like it belongs next to eastern sweats and Tangerian bone grindings, but that's actually an official term, and as for symptoms, it does what it says on the tin. Plus maybe death. While Aki based products aren't- <laughs> Plus death. Wow. I've never heard of Jamaican vomiting sick. And I've been to Jamaica a couple of times, which is- Never got sick though. Outright illegal in the United States, they are very tightly regulated, and the raw fruit itself cannot be imported. So if you're American and want to try it, your options are fully cooked canned Aki or going to Florida where a few people grow it domestically. Next we have- Not surprised. If it was going to be grown anywhere in the U.S., it would be Florida. Bird's Nest Soup. This is another one that I've vaguely heard of, and for years I just assumed the name was a playful metaphor, like ants on a log or shit on a shingle. <laughs> Turns out, nope, this dish contains an actual bird nest, not like a pile of twigs like I was picturing, but rather a specific type of nest only made by certain species of swiftlets. These nests are mostly made out of mucins, which are a set of proteins that, among okay. other things, serve to thicken all those wonderful secretions our bodies make. There's a little bit in human so Sam is getting better and better at these terrifying images. <laughs> Wow. Mucin makes mucus. Yeah, makes sense. Saliva. A little bit more in mucus. And in swiftlet Smile saliva. Face. Look out, pal. So all the swiftlet does is it finds a nice- I like how the other eye he drew on the wall. He did that with a few of his other drawings, too. I just thought I'd point it out now. It's just- it just adds to the charm. I love it. The wall starts- <laughs> Laying out fat strings of slobber, which dry, and eventually she's got a nice place to roost. That is, right up until some gourmand says, Ugh, today I crave bird spit. <laughs> I'm not sure I can handle much more of this. <laughs> gourmand. <laughs> Alright. Hmm. Uh, you can keep the eggs, though. And they then reconstitute it back into its original Jelly. gelatinous texture. Unfortunately, these nests can't enter the U.S. since, believe it or not, eating bird saliva is a great way to catch bird flu. And now the time has come to speak of the ortolan. The ortolan is a kind of bunting, which is a sort of passerine, which is a type of bird. They're birds. Like I love the word association. I've uh, run into this a few times trying to relate certain things and it's usually on things that i know nothing about like costume design or something where i hear one word and then it's another word that i don't know hopefully i try to make nuclear stuff readily accessible but i can totally understand if one silly word just sounds like another one many animals they have a long history of being eaten by the french but what <laughs> separates the ortolan from your average squab or pheasant is the unique way in which it is prepared and eaten they're typically caught with nets and kept in the dark which causes them to overeat for some reason once it's about twice as fat wow. the entire bird is then thrown Fatten into a container of brandy alive and sealed in while this serves to Sounds so stereotypically French. Marinate the creature, it also drowns in the process, thereby killing one bird with no stones. The ortolan yeah, is then roasted, plucked, and presented whole to the consumer, who inserts the carcass into their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way. Mouth feet that. first. As they chew, one hand continues holding the bird's head while the other picks out the larger bones. This whole ritual is usually performed with a towel or large napkin over one's head. There's a few explanations for the purpose of the towel. Some say it's just there to keep the aromas in, while others say it's there to, quote, shield from God's eyes the shame of such a decadent and disgraceful act. Wow. Yeah, this one I'm okay with not trying, actually. Notable fans of this dish include, not joking, Bill Cosby and the guy who invented the lobotomy. Ought to be part of that social club. Our mission is to eat birds whole and then make people not remember things. Killing ortolans was banned across the EU in 2007. Not for any ethical reason, but because French people did this so much that the entire ortolan population was threatened. Thankfully, as of 2018, their conservation status is under least concerns. That is a fast, fast recovery after all of that. It's amazing how, just how humans have that much impact on the population of a certain species that within, what was it, five years, the population went from threatened to least concern. It's like those old adages uh, I remember used to uh, frighten children about, ooh, if you do something bad, a kitten will die. 
well, if that was actually the case and people stopped doing it, the world would be overrun by cats because something's got to keep every population in check. Kind of like managing a nuclear reactor. You keep in mind, whenever you're operating something at steady state, that means power level is stable. The amount of neutrons in equals the amount of neutrons out. The amount, so whenever you, you do something to the plant, you just need to think about what, how that will impact reactivity or how will it change reactor power, whether it go up or down. It's, uh, it's all a, a delicate balance, um, both with nuclear physics, uh, nuclear operational physics, and with ecology. It's really cool. So hopefully the French can get back to it soon. Anyway, <laughs> that's all I have for I, that's And that's exactly right. In order to control something at a certain level, then yeah, you got to accommodate for the inflows and outflows. This one was really good. A lot of gross, a lot of stuff I've never heard of, just like every other episode of Sam O'Neill that I've watched, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.